and we're going to turn it over to Sarah. So go ahead, Sarah. Uh, let me share my screen. Let's talk about some Azure notebooks. One last time. Let's do this. All right. So we have the screen shared. <sighs> I'm gonna try not to get all nostalgic. This is the last time I'm doing this talk and we'll explain why I say that here very shortly. So hello, Hampton Roads.net user group. My name is Sarah Dukevich, also known as Saduki. As any of you coming in early may know, uh, I've known Kevin Griffin for quite a while. We have lots of conference stories. Um, so it's a privilege to be here. I'm very thankful to show you what's going on with Azure Notebooks. Um, Azure Notebooks, fair warning, you're going to see something about it going away. Don't panic. We'll talk about what's going on with it. We're going to talk about the underlying technology first, then what's going on with it, and then when it's going away, what do we uh, expect? And I'll give you some feedback with what I've tried so far. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to post it in chat. Um, I know that Kevin and um, if you are watching the uh, chat channel, I'm also in there, but with me presenting, I may not answer as quickly as I usually do. So on the agenda for tonight, we're going to talk about what is Project Jupyter. Uh, Project Jupyter and Jupyter Notebook, you're going to hear those terms simultaneously and wonder what are they. So we're going to clarify what is Project Jupyter versus Jupyter Notebook. We're going to talk about what languages are supported. We're going to talk about where can this be run? Because I'm running Jupyter locally, uh, but then how to use it. We'll talk about Azure Notebooks and where it can be run. And we'll talk about what is Pandas. Rest assured, there are no animals hurt in this presentation. Okay. And if you see me look to the side, it's because I've got the presentation on multiple screens and sometimes it catches me. So apologies ahead of time. OK, so what is Project Jupyter and what is Jupyter Notebook? The best way to describe it is think of Project Jupyter as the people, the organization behind a product. And Jupyter Notebook is the product. So product, Project Jupyter actually spun off of the IPython project in 2014. Um, that was an interactive Python kind of deal. Project Jupyter uh, goes for open source software, open standards, uh, open, open source services for interactive computing across multiple languages. It has dozens of programming languages. I think that's an understatement. There's a lot of languages going on there. Um, Jupyter Notebook, on the other hand, is the actual product that they make available for us to use. Jupyter Notebook is the tool that we can use for many things, including learning, teaching, analyzing data, and presenting data findings. Now, before you get confused about Jupyter Notebook, Azure Notebooks, I thought you were supposed to be talking about Azure Notebooks. Well, Azure Notebooks under the covers is running the Jupyter Notebook platform with their own customization. So about Project Jupyter. Like I mentioned, it spun off of the IPython project in 2014. It is 100% open source. They do the licensing so that it is easy for other companies to adapt. They release all their products under the modified BSD license. I say all their products. Um, Jupyter Notebook is the main thing that you'll hear. You'll also hear Jupyter Lab, which is related to Jupyter Notebook. Something else uh, about the Jupyter product. Um, so Jupyter is a play on the languages that they started to support. So Ju is from Julia, the Pi is from Python, and the R is from the R language. And when we get into the Azure Notebooks demos, I will show you uh, the R language, and I will show you Python primarily. But I don't have any Julia demos because this is one that I haven't actually seen or explored yet. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks, the name is also a play to Galileo's Notebooks recording Jupyter's moons. So all sorts of plays on words. All right, so Jupyter Notebooks, the screenshot you're about to see here is going to show a sample of the Jupyter Notebook. It is purely a screenshot so that I can actually talk to the different points. So you're going to see that there's a part that says in and a part that says out. 
the in part, it says like in 150, that's the input. That's the code that we're going to pass to what they call the kernel. The kernel is what's offering the language support within the notebook. So if I put in this code, notice that we have syntax highlighting. We have comments, we have methods, we have, I have a string that's getting passed into read CSV. So you can see the different color coding available. But in 150 and the out 150, those will correspond to, so the input, this is the output that goes with it. Um, the output, so in this case, we're taking a look at the, there's a 67 years of Lego um, exercise that was put up a data camp. And this is the output that I was able to gather from that. So this is a sample of what a Jupyter Notebook is all about. You'll notice also that it says, uh, let us start by reading in the colors data. That's text. That's actually a markdown cell. So let's do this. Let's go to, right, I'm gonna actually bring up my Azure Notebook and I'm gonna create a new one so you can see what this is all about. So notebooks.azure.com is where you wanna start. I'll post that link here in the chat. Notebooks.azure.com. Now the project that I have, this is a public link. So I'm gonna copy the link so you can, if you wanna clone this, make a copy of your own, you can. Uh, it was not sent because I did post, so hold off on reposting that. But this is specifically for tonight's presentation. So what we have here, there's a clone, much like GitHub and cloning. Star, if you wanna make this like a favorite repo. Yeah, spam and, spam and protection is engaged. I am a spammer apparently. So I will not post the spam tonight. Um, but then- Aaron, if you put in the Zoom chat, Zoom. I can copy it for you. Awesome. All right, let me see if I can find where the Zoom chat went. Uh, nope. Chat. Yeah, there's no way to unmoderate your your link. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Figured out how to open up chat. There you go. So you can see that my project, I have set it to public. That way you can clone this as well. Um, and it is it's for your user group and today's date. The environment, in case you're curious, there's nothing set up under there. You can have different environments. Um, before we get too carried away with this, this is a preview site. It is going away as of October 9th. Um, story about that, I found out. So I had a, a friend in the community reach out to me and they said, hey, let's do a LinkedIn discussion. I'm like, okay. I'm like, what are we talking about? I'm going unscripted here. He's like, let's just talk about data science and what you're up to. And I'm like, all right, fine. So we pulled up Azure Notebooks. And normally I do this talk, I do the Azure Notebooks talk and show some things, but we were greeted with this yellow message. And at the time it was going away September 29th. And when I saw that, I'm like, September 29th? Wait, 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 it's going away. It kind of made me sad. Um, it doesn't make me sad now because I've read up more as to where, what's happening. But yeah, October 9th, this is going away. So that's why I said, this is the last time I'm doing this talk because it's going away. But rest assured, this talk will carry on as a Jupyter Notebooks talk. Now, I said I was gonna create a new Jupyter Notebook so you can see what this is about, not just a screenshot. So I'm gonna click on the new button and I'm gonna say I want a new notebook. And I'm gonna call this the HamptonRose.net user group uh, Python demo. The reason why I'm doing Python is because I don't know F Sharp. So I'm not going to do a demo tap dancing in F Sharp. Um, and I do have an R sample already, so I'm not going to show that. We'll do Python 3.6. Are any of you using Python? Because I was going to say, if you're using Python, Python 2.7 died this year. Um, their last commit to the 2.7 branch was in April, and they had sent out the email and said, enough is enough, we're done, this is a deadline. It is finally sunsetted. So if you're doing Python 2.7, understand that they're not supporting it anymore. All right. So when I tell it new, you can then see HRMAG Python demo. 
terrible. So open up a new Jupyter notebook. So click on that. This opened up the new notebook. So right here next to the Jupyter logo, that's the name of the notebook. You can easily rename it here. So if I really want to say this is Hampton Roads net Python demo and tell it rename. You can see then it'll rename it here. Um, you see I have unsaved changes. Now we're in an Azure notebook. Um, this is running Jupyter under the cover. So this is why I, I want to cover Jupyter and what it's about. But the demo that I was showing with the Legos. So I'm going to click in the cell. This is called a cell. Um, particularly right now, you see the in with the square brackets. The in with the square brackets is our hint that this is a code cell. The other hint that we have is this drop down. So in our shortcuts bar, um, you'll see a drop down that says code. We can change that to markdown. You'll notice when I change that to markdown, that the in goes away. So this is just a markdown cell. I can say something like one pound. Uh, Hampton uh, .NET user group demo. I'm going to go ahead and press shift enter. Shift enter is going to run the cell. It creates another cell below. And by telling it shift enter, it ran the cell, therefore rendering the markdown. So I like the Lego stuff. And then you could put your code in a code cell. Uh, but maybe I want to put in some more markdown. I can easily make sure the cell is selected. So you'll see the green outline around it and the blinking cursor. Those are cues that this is an active uh, cell, it's an active code cell, because you see it in with the square brackets. Uh, I can say something like import this. Now, for those of you not familiar with Python, the reason why I'm doing import this is so you get a better idea of Python in the community. Now, if I press enter in a code cell, just so you can see what pressing enter does, pressing enter moves me to the next line. Now, you might be wondering, hey, Sarah, how do you do all these keyboard shortcuts? How do you know them all? Well, I'm a keyboard user, so for me, it's important to learn them. But to actually learn them, if you go under help, there's the keyboard shortcuts link. What's nice with the keyboard shortcuts is you start to figure out what makes sense for you to learn and memorize to help you to move more efficiently. The things that I tend to use, whoa, are the Alt Enter, Control Enter, and Shift Enter, which are running the cells. So running and select below, running selected cells, and running cell and insert below. The other ones that I use, let me see if they're on here. I don't see them on here at the moment, um, but there is M to trigger markdown mode. So if I have my cell selected, uh, not active though, but just selected. So the selected is the blue outline, active is the green outline. If I press M on my keyboard, M will change it into markdown. And Y will change it back to code. And if I tell it, uh, go ahead and run. So import this. We'll execute what that actually does, which runs a, it shows a poem by a Pythonier named Tim Peter. Now, Python, unlike .NET, has a very unique community. Um, I say unique because I haven't seen this really with other languages as much, but like Python users are called Pythonistas. And pioneers in the Python industry are called Pythonieers. Um, so Tim Peters is a Pythoneer. He's been working with Python in the early days, and he's a pioneer in the Python world. And this is something you can expect with um, Python code and the formatting, the like readability. Um, if it's easy to explain, that's probably a good idea. If it's hard to explain, it's probably a bad idea. Um, so there's all sorts of different things about what to expect when writing Python or reading Python. But I do this more to show the interactivity. I mean, I could do something like uh, print hello world, the typical hello world. I could do a, the other typical programming language demo of look at my programming language as a calculator as well. 
But what's nice with Jupyter Notebooks is there is that interactivity. You can give it a set of code. Now in the presentation, we're gonna go back to the slide so you can see what else we can do with Jupyter Notebooks. But I wanted to show you what the markdown cell looked like, what the code cell looked like, and how that interactivity looked like because we'll see more pictures as well. Pictures don't do it enough justice though. I gotta show the interactivity. It's fun, you know? Okay, so why Azure Notebooks? Any questions so far? Am I speaking too fast? Chat. chat is pretty empty. A lot of people there, but uh, no, no chatter. Everyone's engaged. I hope so. This is Hopefully awesome. Like, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, let's talk about usages of Jupyter Notebooks. So for learning, for teaching, thanks, Rail Shark. For presenting, and by the way, this presentation is not your standard PowerPoint presentation that you see at user groups. This is an Azure notebook. You can see I've left my browser open and not in full screen so that you can see that there is a URL involved. I can come in here and I can say, double click on my markdown cell and change this and say usages of Jupyter notebook, singular, and then render that. So I'm changing my slide in the middle of the presentation. Um, sometimes I can demonstrate the import this interactivity. Sometimes I cooperate, sometimes it doesn't. So I'm not going to show it right now, but you saw it import this in the notebook. But yes, this presentation is an Azure notebook. So Azure notebook has a feature called the rise slideshows. And um, it's an extension that you can install that Azure notebooks has installed. Uh, but Jupyter Notebook, you get it separately. And the Rise Slideshow uses Reveal.js under the covers. So for those of you who do presentations, if you're familiar with Reveal, Rise will make a lot of sense to you. Now, in terms of language support, Python was the first language. Spinning off of the IPython project, um, that's why Python was the first language, Python in the 2x world. And then as 3x came, we have 2x, 3x, and now it's mostly 3x. As you saw with Azure Notebooks, there's still some 2x support, but it's a dead language now. Um, languages are supported by the concept of kernels. Uh, some languages that you may see, so Julia, which is not supported in Azure Notebook, uh, but they do have a kernel for, for Jupyter. They have kernels for C Sharp, uh, JavaScript, Haskell, Ruby, and some other languages as well. I'm going to go ahead and click on this link so you can see the various kernels that are supported. So if we go to kernels, it looks like they've updated the page recently because the list goes longer. I'm going to go to the list of available kernels. And yes, there are various languages supported, including Fortran. That is Fortran that you're seeing toward the top of the list. Um, Fortran, uh, PySpark, Julia is right there, Ruby, TypeScript, CoffeeScript, FlyScript. If you're not sure if a language is supported, this is a good spot to start. Um, you'll see for the most part that they have their own kernels. Some have samples to give you an example of how to work with them. So Haskell, Hi, Lua, you name it, there's probably a port for it nowadays because uh, Jupyter has done all sorts of things. Jupyter's been around a while for others to actually create the kernels. So, um, so those are the kernels. Jupyter has many extensions as well. So if any of you are teachers, for example, you could use Jupyter Notebooks to create an assignment for your students. And then you can use something, um, there's a extension called MB Grader, which will allow you to do auto grading of your notebook. So you could say, okay, student, here's this notebook. I want you to solve this problem, fill in these blanks with these lines of code, and then program it to actually automatically grade it. Um, the NB extension link that I include has various different pieces to what's included. Um, you'll see the various functions. So let's open that.
And you're going to see that this is on GitHub. Did I mention that Project Jupyter deals with open source? Very fairly well documented on how to install it and work with it and how to enable and disable. Various ex extension ex uh, structures. But then if you want to know more about the extensions, you come into here. And NB extensions is what you want to look at. This is where we get into things such as the code folding, creating the exercises, um, some integration with GIST, uh, you name it, code folding, scrolling, key mapping, making thing, tables look prettier, all sorts of different uh, extensions to work with. So being open source makes it easy for people to see the code, makes it easy for people to extend as well, which is great to see. It's a great community to keep an eye on. So that's Jupyter Notebooks, but why Azure Notebooks? This is a tough one. Why Azure Notebooks? Azure Notebooks are going away. But what was good about Azure Notebooks is that the cloud hosted Jupyter Notebooks. Now, there are other opportunities for hosted Jupyter Notebooks. And we will talk about Microsoft's uh, replacements for Azure Notebooks here toward the end of this. But Azure Notebooks, like I said, cloud hosted Jupyter Notebooks, great for presentations like this one. This is an Azure Notebook. We'll take a look at that towards the end so you can see what that looks like. Um, you'll see that it's good for interactive languages. Python, R and F, Sharp are the ones that are supported by Azure Notebooks. But if you're running Jupyter locally or on a different service, you may see other language support as well. And you can see learning new things, taking notes. So put it in perspective, back in 2018, uh, it's in between full-time jobs. I was taking a, a job as a consultant, helping some folks train. And I myself wanted to make sure I had pieces of paper to kind of add to credibility. Because I've worked with all sorts of programming languages, but some people want that piece of paper. So I went through DataCamp has a R, R programmer track and a Python programmer track. And I went through both. Um, and why did I go through both? Because I love data. It's something I've always loved in my career. I loved it as a developer. I've loved it as a database administrator, various roles in between, uh, SQL Server reports, writer, uh, crystal reports writer. I have a problem with data. <laughs> um, but yeah, with Azure Notebooks, it's been nice that I could actually go through the R track and go through the Python track and use Azure Notebooks to take notes as I'm going through the course, getting used to the syntax, getting used to that interactivity. Um, the R program also has its own notebook syntax, which is similar to Jupyter. But so why Azure Notebooks? It's good for learning, it's good for teaching, good for showing results. I'll have examples of those. Uh, let's look at the file structure. All right, so this is the project. So it starts out with a project. The project is the, the main container. Ooh, what did Azure Sharp just say? But they're using Visual Studio Code notebooks in the classroom with great success. Awesome. It is pretty exciting, even though .NET Interactive forces the file in Visual Studio Code. Uh, yeah, it is still Jupyter under the presentation or it is still Jupyter under the hood, which is good. I haven't played with the Visual Studio Code Notebooks as much yet. I'd like to, because um, I'm hearing good things about it. And that's one of the migration paths. So, so I have a bunch of IPy and B files. Those are the, the IPython notebook files. So Jupyter, even though you might have like R or F sharp or Python, you're going to see that consistent IPy and B for the file extension. Um, you're going to see ramen ratings I talk about, Animal Crossing I talk about, the R demo. Actually, let's fire up the R demo. So I'm going to click on the R demo. All right. So the R demo, the reason why I like doing the R demo is to show a language other than Python, just so you can see what multiple languages look like. So. Waiting for it to load a little bit more. There we go. So you can see with R, we have variable assignments that look a little differently. But you can see there's ins and there's no outs. But you see that the output is associated with the block above it. 
Um, these in particular are all code blocks. But I could go in here and I could say, let's insert a cell above. I'm gonna make this markdown, oops, uh, inside the active cell, but in the selected cell. So I pressed escape to change it from active to selected. So that while well, you saw the green border go and change to blue, I press M for markdown. And I'm gonna say R demo. That way you can see that we can add a markdown cell in an R notebook. Now, if you're curious as to whether I'm in R or Python, maybe you don't work with either of these languages. There's another giveaway. Well, unfortunately, in the video, my Zoom uh, screen is going to cover up what I really need to show you. So let's see if I can do this and bring it over here. Uh, let's see if that helps. So now you should end up seeing my Legoland background, which is fine. You see my family. But the thing that I really want to point out, I want to make sure that my video is not blocking it, is that there should be this R, it's a blue R with a gray swirly around it. That is the R language logo. So typically you'll see a language logo of some sort for the kernel. The other giveaway is, so this is your project name to the right of the logo. And to the bottom right of that, this is telling us what kernel we're running. This is the R kernel. So there are various hints in the UI as to which kernel you're working with. If you find you're somebody who works with multiple kernels, then knowing that will be very helpful. Now this is that enter exit rise slideshow, but I don't have the slideshow set up for R. Questions so far? I don't see any questions, just lots of praise from lots Sydney praise. about Visual Studio Notebooks. That's cool. I'm looking forward to seeing them in code. I haven't had a chance to play with it in code just yet. I've, I've migrated some to GitHub. We'll talk about that. All right, so we've on the Python demo, user group demo, the, the readme, that includes various links down here. So if you clone this project, or I can have Kevin include this in the meetup links as well so that you can review it. You'll have all these links to where do I get my data, my various hosted data sets that I like to check out. Um, creating this slideshow was really fun too. So I have links for uh, Azure Notebooks and then Microsoft's documentation for uh, running the right slideshow is really great. So I made sure to include that in the readme as well. I have a data folder here. And this includes the CSVs uh, that you'll see in the various notebooks. I usually put my data in a data folder just to make it easier for organizing. Ooh, looks like we're getting raided by Sir Linux Van Friedes. So yeah, as I was mentioning, I like to put the CSVs in a data file or a data folder just for organization, make it a little bit easier. And then I have some images in the images folder. And these are just images that I refer to in the presentation. So this exploring Lego data set, for example, this is the one that you saw in the slides. So these are our folder structures. All right, so let's go back to the presentation of why Azure Notebooks? So the file structure, and I love showing that this is a slideshow and a notebook all at the same time. The Rise slideshow feature, I was just like, I have to show people, you can create slides for your data. It makes life easier. Um, and actually, see if it's gonna let me open. So I'm going back to the file structure again to see if it'll let me open this in two. Yeah, it doesn't let me open it in uh, two tabs. So here's the presentation in the notebook itself. I'm still running it two tabs over in presentation mode, but I wanted to show you the Rise Slideshow feature. And I have things that are marked as slides. 
and I have things that are marked as subslides. So being able to go up and down, that's a feature of having subslides. There's the thing like that. Now, if you don't have these slides, so you'll notice if we go to our Hampton Roads .NET Python demo, our slide thing isn't there. Yeah, Azure Sharp. So it's called the Rise Slideshow. And this happened to be uh, already set up in Azure Notebooks, but you can run it locally as well. Um, I haven't tried it with Visual Studio Code, but if I do get that working, I will gladly talk about it more. Um, but you'll notice it's not here. The only reason why it's not here is because you have to turn those on. So you have to come up to View, Cell Toolbar, and then tell it Slideshow. And then the slide types will appear. And then there are various things you can do, like slide, subslide. I haven't gotten into fragment, skip, and notes, um, because mostly the things that I put in my notebook are things that I do want to present. So just so you're aware that there are other slide types, but the ones I focus on are slide and subslide. So I could turn this and say that this is a slide, this is a slide, this is a slide, this is a slide. And I can go ahead and I can tell it, enter exit right slideshow. And that's how I start the slideshow. And I could say there's import this. But if I want to say something like x equals four, uh, wait, come back here, and x, so I have an output. So you can edit the slides while you're in slide mode. You have the interactivity in slide mode. It's pretty cool when you're doing slides and uh, code demos. So I can only imagine this in other languages as well. Like primarily by day right now, I'm working in React. Um, but Python, I still do training for some folks on as need be. So yeah, that's the Rise slideshow under the covers. All right, let's close that one and close this one and actually go to our presentation again. I love doing the, there's nothing up my sleeves and showing you all how this runs because then you see more functionality of the notebook. So how does this for note taking? I never make it to this slide and hold off on the new notebook demo. That new notebook demo comes very much earlier because I get so excited. I love showing the interactivity for all of this. So we've already seen the interactivity. Let's take a look and see what all can we do. So when I first did this talk, it was just talking about Azure Notebooks. And then for those of you on Twitch, um, there's a team called the Live Coders. And they did a conference in June and said, hey, can you do your Azure Notebooks talk for us there? I was like, sure, why not? And so you're going to see that I call out some of the different um, streamers because you can learn various technologies from them. Um, in Azure Notebooks, they support Python, R, and F Sharp. I haven't really found good R or F Sharp streams on Twitch. But if you want to learn Python, uh, BeginBot, he's one of my favorite ones to watch because he solves Rubik's Cubes on stream, like it's nothing. Um, Cyber Barbie, Code Show, Beachcast, Ninjayo, there's some of the other cool ones. Um, Ninjayo will also do some Internet of Things stuff. Uh, her, her deal with Python gets to be very exciting. Uh, Mastermind.io, so before I, I went and did the conference, I was checking out some of the other live coder streams. I am not a live coder, um, but I will gladly support them just because I haven't been able to set a, a regular stream. Um, but I went into Mastermind.io's Python stream the one night, and he was streaming uh, exercise in Baby Shark. Yes, the song. No, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> yes, I'm a mom. Yes, I know that song well. If you don't know the song, don't look up Baby Shark because then you're going to be mad at me later. Um, it's one of those songs that kind of gets stuck in your head. It's this generation's lamb chops play along closing theme song <laughs> is the best way to put it. Um, so yeah, Python, R, and F sharp are what Azure Notebook supports. Again, before I even, in the early days of doing this talk, I didn't even talk about Jupyter so much, but now I do. So you've seen the list of kernels. 
Note taking in Jupiter is awesome because you have markdown. Uh, markdown it also, it, because this is in like the sciencey world, you might have to, oh, Kevin, no, don't sing, Kevin. <laughs> Um, you might have to work with equations if you're doing hard science and math. So you might need to do something like latex formatting. Rest assured, you can do latex formatting in Azure notebooks. You can do it in Jupyter notebooks. It uses a library called MathJax to support it. So to get those equations, like what you see here with the e to the i e to i to the pi plus one equals zero, uh, that formatting that's latex. And if you're curious to see what it looks like, I'll double click. No, Kevin, we are not singing Baby Shark on stream. <laughs> uh, but this is what um, this is what the, the latex looks like. So the dollar sign on either side, and then e i to the pi plus one. Rest assured, if you don't understand the syntax, but know you need to do those kind of equations, I've included this link here about the Jupyter Notebook Markdown Cells document. It includes a lot of links on um, latex and how to work with it. And you know, on a side note, it's Shark Week for my kids' summer camp, so they've been singing Baby Shark too. All right, Markdown support. So you, you folks have been seeing a lot of me going into cells and showing you the things under the covers. You know that Azure Notebooks is supporting Markdown very well. Uh, you can embed HTML too. So my roots are in web programming. I've been writing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript since the late 90s. Lots of that. So when I thought I could do HTML in the uh, Jupyter Notebooks and Azure Notebooks, I was super excited. Um, so just so you can see what this looks like, I will double click on my cell. Double clicking on the cell allows me to go into the edit mode. Uh, you can see that we've got markdown support include links to some of my uh, live coded friends and their pro uh, profiles. So you can see that when it came to linking the images, I'm like, oh, I got this in Markdown. But table layouts in Markdown, table layouts and I are not friends in Markdown. Well, excuse me, but I wasn't going to try to figure out if Flexbox worked with Jupyter. At that point, I hadn't gotten back into web development as much. Now I'm gonna have to go and play around with that. All right, so let's go ahead and run that cell again so we can see the pictures. So the demo I do for showing down Markdown is a, a lot of hats. Do any of you play Animal Crossing? <laughs> Latex powered by every side department since the 90s. Oh, so true, so true. Remember doing Latex back in my comp side program late 90s and that was not fun. And MATLAB, and Maple, oh, memories. Anyhow, so if you play Animal Crossing, you may know something about hats. Um, my friend Jeff Fritz, he's this first guy here, C Sharp Fritz. If you ever tune into his stream on Twitch, he's all about wearing different hats. Uh, so I was like, no, this isn't about his hats, but this is about Animal Crossing's hats. And these other live coders, InstaFluff, and Fierce Kittens, and uh, Brent Schooley, Chef Brent, and Noob Cat. They all play Animal Crossing, or at least I've been, I've been told that. So it's like this, this is shout outs to them. Oh yeah, we should actually like run that cell. There we go, that's better. Now you can see the hats. There are many, many hats. Uh, it gets cut off because there are way too many hats um, in Animal Crossing. Uh, you saw the HTML, you'll see floats in there. That's old school HTML. Sorry, at that point I hadn't figured out Flexbox and its awesomeness. Um, but what I did is I grabbed, there's a Animal Crossing um, data set over on Kaggle. And I put these in here as disclaimers. These images are hosted by VillagerDB. That's what's included in the data set. Animal Crossing is a registered trademark of Nintendo. I do not own any of the trademarks to it. I'm just displaying this from VillagerDB, um, just so you can see the Animal Crossing data set. I'm gonna open that up so you can see that as well. I'm let it run. And it's already imported the cells and stuff because I ran it earlier, but you can see 
But there's these villager DB URLs. Those villager DB URLs, those are the half I'm displaying in the presentation. I did some exploring for things to see what was going on. Uh, let's go back to the presentation. So if you think that I actually wrote all of these divs manually, no, 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 no. I am a developer. Please don't DMCA. Um, so I used a for loop in Python to read in the data set, give me all the hats. And from that collection, so I guess let's go back to the, the um, notebook. And I'm going to go ahead and say cell, run all the cells. That way, that, that way it will refresh all of the outputs. We can see what's going on. So I am using pandas. Pandas is a popular data manipulation, data cleaning tool used in Python. Um, it happens to be one of the tools I cover in a data engineering uh, presentation I deal with. So I use pandas to take the data from a CSV file and read it into what they call a data frame. The data frame is essentially a variable with all sorts of rows and columns. Um, and then what I do is I usually want to see like the first 10 rows. Let's see what it looks like in there. And so I look at the first 10 rows, just get a feel for data. And like I said, there's the villager DB links. I call info on my data frames. So I want to know more about not only the rows and columns in terms of like column names, but then I can also see how many rows do I have. Um, that's if you see in the range index. The range index is the type of index I have. I have 4,565 entries. I can see for each of those how many not null entries are in each of those columns. So I get a good layout for what that data is structured as. All right. Then I did some more poking at things to see, well, well, what kind of categories do we have? These items in this Animal Crossing database or data set or data frame, which categories were the most popular? That's where we saw furniture. So I did some experimenting on that. I'm going to scroll all the way down to where the hats are because I talk about these later on. So what I did, here's the code. And I said, OK. I want the items data frame where I read all the CSV information. Filter it down so that I'm only looking at the items that have the category equal to hats. And then I want to call iter rows on it. That way I can actually iterate through the collection. And then I grab the source, which is that villager DB link. And then I grab the name of the hat. So I can use that for alt. And then I go ahead through and I have it so it's alt text for the image as well as then the caption as well. And then I was just like, I do with this, I do this with code quite often, or I let my code generate code for me. I mean, in this case, I'm letting Python generate HTML for me. I've had PowerShell generate HTML for me. Uh, scripting languages are awesome for doing things like that. But then I just copied all of these and pasted them in to get the hats that we saw here. So it was a simple, let's use Python to loop through a collection, get my values, generate the HTML for me, copy and paste into a slide. So it's pretty neat to see how you can make this stuff work for you. Another one, so let's talk, have you heard about Kaggle? Let's find my tabs. There it is, maybe. Oh, Zoom. There we go. So there's a website called Ramen Raider. And I happen to find this while looking at data sets on Kaggle. So Kaggle.com has data sets, it has notebooks, it has data competitions for those who are the competitive type. Um, but what I liked about this data set, so I love ramen. I love noodles. I'm married to a guy who's part Chinese. So noodles are a thing here in our house, very much so. Uh, traditional ramen is really cool, but it's not the same as the ramen I grew up with, the Mara Chan ramen. It, it, they're different leagues, much different leagues. 
Um, but I found this Raman data set and I was like, okay, I need to take a look at it a little bit more. So found it on Kaggle. What's nice is there's usually a story behind it. So you can see where did this come from? Somebody took it from a guy's blog and put it into data form, which is really awesome. You can get previews of the data. So what kind of brands are in here? What kind of varieties, what kind of styles, things like that. You can filter your columns out. So I could say, I don't care about seeing the review number in the preview. That graph is useless to me, so apply. So Kaggle allows us to filter our data sets and, and see what it looks like at that level. This particular one, if I go to uh, the columns, you can see what's valid, what they think might be invalid. This one is a clean data set up until we get to top 10. And we have a lot of missing values. So Kaggle really makes it neat to see data sets. You can rate the data sets. So this says it's a usability of 7.1 because it has various checkboxes that you have to meet. Um, one being, uh, one of the things that you have to do is include some details about your columns. Um, but anyhow, so ramen ratings. I was looking at this, I was like, okay, what kind of brands are there? I grew up in a very sheltered life. Ravichan ramen, maybe 10 cents for a pack. It was awesome. That was like a really happy day for me when I heard that we'd had packs of ramen. I, I really didn't grow up with a, a lot of culture at the time, but that was my big thing. So then I saw this ramen database. And I'm like, ooh, what else is out there? What other brands are out there? So I ended up downloading the CSV file and creating a notebook. Well, actually, I created a notebook in Kaggle and then brought it over here. So let me pull up here. So Kaggle is one of those sites that if I need to find data sets, that's probably where I'm going to start. Again, there's my pandas, importing the CSV in to my data frame. Shape tells me the number of rows and the number of columns. Again, info gives me the total number of entries and then where they're nulls, what the null layout looks like. Uh, head without a number, it's top five. If I want to look at the end of it, I can do a tail. What and tail without a number is five. But then I was like, okay, what brands are there? How many brands? And that's how I got to the, the bar chart that Nissen, Nissen is like the king in this set of data. A lot of Nissen ramen in here. And then scroll past a bunch of other stuff. I'm gonna show you, so we did how to create horizontal bar charts. We wanted to show how to do a, a histogram and see what the ratings look like. And then line 17, the in 17, this is when I changed things up a little bit. And I said, okay, we've got the import, but looking at the one above here, that gives me nightmares of MATLAB and Maple and the graphics of that. I want something a little cleaner, a little prettier, a little more modern. So I brought in Seaborn for that. And Seaborn makes it so it's, it doesn't look so MATLAB-y. It doesn't look so old school. Then I use Seaborn for uh, rendering a box plot. So the box plot story, I was curious about, does it make a difference if you have ramen in a cup versus a pack versus a bowl versus a box? And then I saw a cannon bar. As you can see in the following lines after, I was like, what is this bar and what is this can? Somebody made ramen in a chocolate bar, and the ramen rater rated it five stars, so it must be a really good ramen bar. And I was like, ramen in a can, are we talking like can of noodle soup, like the Campbell's do a ramen version? Somehow that doesn't seem to sit really well with me. But then when I did this filtering, I saw ramen ratings style can, it showed that it was Nissen Top Ramen Chicken Flavor Potato Crisps. And when you see the brand, oh, Pringles, potato chips. Yeah. Hey, Brandonius, thanks for joining us tonight. So I was very curious about all of this. Go to the presentation again. So yeah, we were, I was very confused about the, 
the can and the bar because I'm like I'm used to ramen be it in a packet or in some other way as well. Hello, the grumpy game dev and welcome. So yeah, used to normal eating ramen from a bowl, can and box or can and bar what threw me for the loop. So I was able to use Azure Notebooks to filter that data set and explore it even more. Uh, let's just a little bit more about the item CSV just so you can see where that is on Kaggle. Uh, click on that link. So once you, if you clone this project, you will have the links to all these data sets as well. I made sure to include those on the slides. So this is the first Animal Crossing thing I had found, and this was updated three three months ago. So it's a bit older now. But Animal Crossing New Horizon apparently is all the rage with the, those of us who are stuck inside. Now at my house, I can't play Animal Crossing because I barely get time on the Switch. My boys are into Zelda Breath of the Wild. So no Switch for me right now. That's OK. I'll stick to Stardew Valley. I'll stick to Forager Nuclear. Those are my games for now. But for those of you into Animal Crossing, uh, this is a data set that it's really well laid out. They have good story. They have good acknowledgment as to who created this. They even have various CSVs. Paper Mario. Oh yeah, Rail Shark, it's true. If, if you can find a switch, switches are in high demand. Um, we got lucky, we have a, a switch we've had a while and then my husband picked up the switch light so that they could play against each other. Like I said, I have two kiddos, six and eight. Oh, Brandonia's tabletop simulator, what you playing? So yeah, Kaggle, we've got the CSVs, but notice here, these details, these columns actually have descriptions. When I saw this, I was like, it's a data set that actually has descriptions. It has really good descriptions. And those field names, there's no spaces in the field names. Ooh, Overwatch on the Switch, I don't know about that. Gloomhaven, I've heard it's pretty good. I haven't played it myself. But again, with Kaggle, we can filter the different categories. So I could say, I don't want any of these selected. So I do the select all and select all, make it easier. Ooh, code names tabletop. That sounds good. So I could say, maybe I just want name and category, sell them by value, apply. So Kaggle, it's nice because it shows us the breakdown of the columns. And it shows this particular data set, the person took the time to actually add the columns. Now, you might be wondering, Kaggle, who contributes to this? Anyone can. If you have data you want the world to use, go for it. It's as simple as logging in, creating an account, then uploading your data. I actually updated or added data. This is about four months ago, and it's 116 meg. It is 2.3 million records um, from April of 2016, I think it is, or to April of 2020. Yes, I said 2.3 million records. We have sensors. So we have temperature sensors and humidity sensors scattered throughout the house. And they report back to a MySQL database. And then I asked my husband for the MySQL database link because I can never remember it. And then we export it into a zip file and then I upload it here. So if you want some dirty data to work with, the data here is not really that well organized. This is why we give it to folks. But I did kind of make little descriptions here. So if you have data you want to share with the world, consider doing it here on Kaggle. You can give it various licensing and other information as well. On the metadata, this is some of the things that it'll ask you for. So I use Kaggle for finding fun data sets like the Animal Crossing one. And then this is kind of what I do is I, as soon as I get a data set, I start to explore. I read in it, it's typically a CSV that I'm using, and I'll use uh, pandas and Python. And then I like to use head and tail to look at the beginning and the ending of the data set. Sometimes I'll do length just to get the row count. Again, there's also shape and info will give you more insights as well. If you see the percent net plot, live in line in the Azure notebooks. It's so that you keep your graphs 
in with your notebook. Depending on what platform you're using, some will render the charts and graphs separate from the notebook, um, be it in a separate window, separate files. So Matplotlib inline is so that it stays with the notebook. So that's why you you see that in some of these. Some of these I didn't have to do that for, it was good, but some I had to put it in there. But you can see this is how I did the 10 most populated categories for the items in that items.csv. My friends are always asking me, hey, can you tell us if there's a relationship between buy values, sell values? And I'm like, I might be able to see it. Well, I could see it with the um, CSV file. It's a fairly uh, linear relationship. You can see the how it goes up. I did it first for furniture. And I did it, this is actually not for wallpaper, this was for hats. There we go. So that was for hats for the buy and sell value as well. So this is what happens with the, the charts. They were asking about, hey, are these related? Can you see that? No, I haven't found anything. So those of you who do play, I haven't found any good streams that tie directly into the stock market. Um, so that's a thing for those of us who don't play Animal Crossing, they can sell these turnips and the turnip sell values change, they fluctuate. And they have this thing called the stock market um, and there's Daisy May, which is like a play I believe on Fannie Mae. So <laughs> it, it's fun. Fun references in Animal Crossing. But I haven't found an interface to talk to those. Okay, so now the bad news. Azure Notebooks is going away. I've been playing with this for the past two years. I've been doing the talk for the past two years. And everybody has asked me, Sarah, 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 when's the preview going away? When can we use this for public stuff? When can we use this for production stuff? And I've been like, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, I'm a Microsoft MVP, but I don't get to talk to the Azure Notebooks team much. So I don't know. Well, now oh, I know it's coming to an end. Um, there are different migration paths. There is GitHub, but it treats it as a, a file. And so you can see JSON diffs. It's not the greatest in terms, it's good for storage and version control. But if you actually want to render the notebook, GitHub wouldn't be my first choice. Um, I've had issues with the way it displays things. So it's just like, eh, it's an option. That's what it is, it is an option. Now, if you'd like using GitHub for your code reviews and you're really committed to Jupyter Notebooks and GitHub, the thing you're gonna wanna consider is Review NB. So Review NB is a tool that'll allow you to review Jupyter Notebook changes instead of being JSON diffs, they're actually notebook diffs. I mentioned that you've got to be really committed to this because there is a cost associated with review and So it's not free. Um, but if you are all about notebooks and all about GitHub for code uh, versioning and seeing changes, review and is a tool you could consider. Now, I know that you can do notebooks in Visual Studio Code. And I believe Azure Sharp was talking about using them as well. Ah, so Azure Sharp said the new bullet point is notebooks in Visual Studio Code with the .NET Interactive extension, not just Python extension. Doesn't require Jupyter installation and is powered by Blazor. Interesting. I'm curious to see how that's running. If you don't have a Jupyter installation, I'm curious to see what they're doing with that. Yeah, super annoying on the GitHub issues board. Somebody's got to keep them on their toes. You get them. Oh, Kevin, those are fighting words. Silver light, light switch, blazer, those fads. <sighs> fighting words, indeed. <laughs> All right, so Visual Studio Code, she, she said with the .NET Interactive extension. Oh, I'm gonna have to change that. .NET Interactive.
Yeah, we'll definitely check that out after this presentation to see more of what it's about. All fads. <laughs> oh, streaming, all fads. Visual Studio Code Spaces is another migration path. I haven't really looked at these last three either. I was curious about GitHub and I was kind of disappointed by it. So it was very sad. Um, but the requires of Microsoft and Azure subscription in the deal, uh, Visual Studio Code Spaces allows you to do this stuff in an online environment. Um, Azure ML is another platform that's using Jupyter Notebooks and Azure Lab Services. Um, I was talking with another uh, person in the community and he was telling me about the expenses of Azure Lab Services. So again, if you're committed to using it as a teaching tool, Azure Lab Services might be worth looking into. Uh, making first consulting money on Silverlight, you know, whatever pays the bills. Old Reader is a good Google replacement. Good to know. XAML. <laughs> oh, XAML. So yes, Azure Notebook is going away. However, there are plenty of Jupyter uh, Notebook alternatives for the Visual Studio space. So rest assured, all you .NET friends, Microsoft's got our back. Jupyter itself isn't going away anytime soon. And also, the Azure Notebooks. You can click here. They may update with more options if they have them, but for the most part, they're here with notebooks, with code spaces, machine learning, that's Azure ML, Azure Lab Services, and like I said, GitHub. GitHub again. And it's you're checking code in, JSON diffs. It is what it is, it's an option. All right, go back to the slides. So we're playing in Jupyter Notebook. If you want to play with this at home, you want to see what other data is out there, here are some places you can start for finding data to play with. Kaggle is my favorite for what I call fun data sets, not boring serious data sets necessarily. I mean, there are serious data sets there, don't get me wrong. If I want to find Animal Crossing, if I want to find ramen, if I want to find something that's exciting and silly, Kaggle is where I would start. If I want to find maybe government related stuff, then data.gov is there. Um, NASA has open data, Blender has open data, New York City's open data. Really good collections of data. And when I say really good, I'm going to use that term loosely um, because by really good, there's a, a, an amount of data that's just ridiculous, but it could also be very gross data. Part of working in data engineering, data science, is you spend a lot, a lot of time taking these data sets and then cleaning them up so that you can use them. So, so yes, these are our various sources. Uh, AWS Data Exchange and Knowledge Zone are some of the newer ones I've heard of. Again, more places for data. Data, data everywhere. Oh, I love this slide. This is my favorite slide because it tells me to shut down. This is. And the reason why I like it is because I'm going to go ahead and close it. I will post my contact information in the chat channel. But just so you can see, this is the standard reminder I have for anybody working in the cloud space. If you have cloud resources and you're no longer using them, shut them off. Do not let them consume resources in the back when they don't need to. Do not uh, run a very high cloud bill because you've done that. Don't be me who has done that. I'm going to close all of my notebooks. That's my last slide. We are now back at the file structure. You can see that I am running on free code dot dot dot. That means I'm running on free compute. And I want to go ahead and tell it to shut it down. Why? Because I am running a cloud resource. I don't need that. I don't need it to incur costs. So now I'm no longer running it. You should still be able to access it by cloning it. It just means that I'm not running the cycles to go ahead and show the whole demo. You see that Kevin has posted my Twitter. I am very active on Twitter. I am slowly coming to life here on Twitch. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn.com slash in slash Sudoku. I am Sudoku everywhere. 
So if you are trying to find me on social media, if you can't find me a Sudoku, I'm probably not there. Um, but are there any other questions? You got spammed, uh, guarded when whatever you just posted. Was that your LinkedIn? That was my LinkedIn. All right. If you drop it in the chat, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll copy it over for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, that's Dookie. She's a spammer. <laughs> Sorry. Everyone's a spammer. I, I, because I don't know if anyone saw it earlier. We had the, the bot come in and went, I what, saw 500 the followers? Like, yeah. Yeah. Totally. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I saw the bot and I'm just like, oh, keep presenting, keep presenting. <laughs> I'm getting used to doing the Twitch streams and I'm just like, okay, ignore the, the bot. There we go. The awesome. Cool. All righty. Well, friends, you have any questions for Sarah? We could just reminisce about conferences for another 20 minutes. Oh, I've got time, man. Yeah. Ah. Our time, I've got, I still even have tea because I wasn't drinking much of my presentation. Let's see. I wonder what my first post COVID conference is going to be. Yeah. When is post COVID going to happen, though? First? Well, in the United States, never. Oh, Never. Maybe when's the inauguration? Uh, <laughs> January. Is this January twentieth? Yeah. I think. Depending on how that goes, um, it could be as early as January, right? Maybe. Um, yeah. No, I, 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 don't, I, don't think, <laughs> I don't think a pandemic can easily be cured by just changing the leadership. If it could, I think we'd find somebody to overthrow the government beforehand. Uh, whenever this happens, this post-COVID stuff. It'll be nice to be back in person again. I miss seeing people. Yeah. Yep. I want some mask swag. Mm -hmm. Like you show up and like you don't get your t-shirt, you get your mask. That'll be yeah. the new thing. That's mm. that's exactly what I would do if I was doing an in-person conference. I would have mask swag. Mask swag. And cost associated with it though, for as big as the conferences are that we run, you know. We have to imagine they're buying t-shirts and these cost um however many dollars. I've you know, I've run conferences. I should know how much a t-shirt costs. Yeah, I was going to say, um, we run. Uh, I just, I know the, I know the total number. I never think about the cost per person. Uh, right. But it, it's less fabric, right? So it should be. Should. Should. If you're going with the cheap cloth Theoretically, ones. a little bit less money. If you go with the know, nicer maybe. ones, a little more. <laughs> Conference swag of, of masks. Who are you wearing today? Well, I've got Code Mesh today, and then Code Stock, and Code Palooza. Exactly. And, and who's the one down? Um, the Dev Dev Up. Dev Reach. Dev Space. Dev Space. That's right. That's, this is I'm uh, like, conference. Yeah, yep. Chris's conference. So yeah, we've got those guys down there. I mean, he... Stir Track will hopefully come back. I hope so. I I submitted for Stir Track and think it. Didn't get selected. I'm like, well, sorry. COVID. Like I <laughs> cursed everyone with COVID because COVID. I didn't get selected for a conference. <sighs> I'm I was on the speaker selection committee for that too. So sorry, Sarah. man. <laughs> it's all right. It, it's like I completely understand because that is like that is top tier talent right there. There's a lot of competition. It's a lot so, of competition. Yeah. Unfortunately, like every conference, all of us on speaker selection, we're like, yeah, we want them all, but we don't have enough tracks. Yep. And you're in the movie theater. Like there's only so much room you have. It's a decent sized movie theater. We've upgraded theaters over the years and we've still managed to fill the theater. So Well, what was the movie gonna be this year? Was it supposed to be Black Widow or was it something else? I think it was supposed to be Black Widow. I would have to check with Blankenberg yeah. on that. <sighs> Next year, maybe. I hope so. <laughs> Next year maybe it will still be Black Widow. <laughs> no! <laughs> At this rate. Um, wow. Yeah, and so I'm hoping conferences come back eventually. Even user groups. It's just one day. Yep. I miss the people. It's just like the before times. Just, yeah. Well, I don't think it'll ever be just like the before times. Before times. Um. Alrighty. Well, chat is being super quiet right now. And I see that. I saw I thinking, Azure Sharp is lurking. Yeah. That's all right. So I was thinking we do a raid. Yeah, so raid, raid our good friend Joe, Joe. Guagno. Yeah. 
because uh, he's only got two lowly people watching him right now. And I think one of them's me. Um, so we need to send him some love. I almost set the raid. Um, so here's the rules of raiding. You go over to Joe's channel, just yell like raid and tell him you came from this channel. Tell him that Sarah sent you and hang out no, for a couple no. minutes. Give him a follow if you're feeling charitable. Uh, and if you're not following me, give me a follow. If you're not following Sarah, give Sarah a follow. Drew, you don't Twitch, so you don't okay, need to follow Drew. Drew. It's okay, um, Drew. I'm not there oh, yet. Well. I'm getting there. Give us all, give us all a follow and go over and let's chat with Joe for a couple minutes. I mean, like five minutes tops, and then you can leave. But, or just hang out. Joe's a cool dude. Yeah, we love Talk Joe. about events. He's out in Arizona, is it? And does the he is, camp Phoenix. out there? Yeah. Yeah. Joe, Joe's good people. He's, he's our conference people. We got to support him. All righty. Well, with that, everyone, thank you so much for hanging out with us, Sarah. You're welcome. Thank you for and having we'll, me. This was fun. We'll see everyone back next month. Or if you're following me, I'm probably back tomorrow. Um, but with that, let's go. Let's go raid Joe and raid now. And right, I think so, we're raiding. Yep, we're raiding. I'm going yep, to there's Joe. Over. 